Hey, hello, how do you do? Shane Your Eggs here. So the other day, my bestest buddy in the whole wide world, Just a Robot, released a video on Mary Sue's and Gary Stews. The video itself is pretty standard for JAR, nothing really too special, but there was one moment that made me and several others raise an eyebrow. But I'll give you an example of a female character who isn't a Mary Sue. Cora. Then it's war! This was an incredibly minor part of Jar's video, and to most, it's probably not worth getting worked up about, but it was the moment that stuck with me all throughout the video. I am not the biggest Korra fan. I mean, I was fine with most of the Korra series that I saw, but the character herself is someone whom I've always hated and immediately labeled a Mary Sue. And the more she did, the more I felt that way. I'm sorry, Phantom Senpai, please forgive me. However, Jar was talking about Korra as a whole, and I've only seen up to half of season three of her series. Whatever opinion I may have on Korra, it's not an informed one. I will vehemently defend that season one Korra is a Mary Sue, but afterwards, I'd have a harder time fighting that battle. Still, while my opinions might not be fully informed, I was, and still am, not the only one who contests Jar on this notion. Scroll to the comment section and you'll find plenty of disagreement. And if you don't care about Jar's personal fan base, there's that video by ER where he continues to call Korra a Mary Sue, with lots of people in the comments agreeing with him. So, is this where I dunk on Jar with my awesome literature knowledge, proving once and for all that the programmer is superior to the AI? Well, no. For one, when Skynet takes over, I'm gonna need a voucher and Jar's the best one I've got. And two, Jar's right. Well, kinda. See, this is why the unimportant Korra mentioning is where my brain zeroed in. Jar defending a character whom many others would call a Mary Sue is the gateway to me discussing something that I've wanted to talk about for a long time. And that's the evolution of the term itself. Most of us know where the original definition comes from. Star Trek fans kept creating OCs that were perfect until eventually a satirical character with the name Mary Sue was created. The term became universally understood as characters whom the story gave all the tools to succeed and who did succeed in pretty much everything, obviously because the writer favored them. This is the definition Jar is going by and this is why he doesn't view Korra as a Mary Sue. Korra, even with just season one where I call her a Mary Sue, has several moments where she doesn't succeed. She can't airbend, she gets arrested, the equalists capture her on multiple occasions, Amon succeeds in taking away most of her bending. How can you call this character perfect? You can't. She's clearly flawed and so by definition she's not a Mary Sue. If you're using that definition. Now, I know some of you are rolling your eyes. I too hate when people start talking about changing definitions. Usually the person is just doing that because they want to be right in an argument. I can easily see people thinking that I just want to hate certain characters. And if I can label those characters something hateable, like Mary Sue, then I can pretend like my hatred of said character is justified. But in the words of Jar himself, there is such a thing as the evolution of language. And I think I can make a pretty good argument on why it should apply here. The reason we have the term Mary Sue is because we need a term that identifies a specific type of character. This character has been given clear favoritism by the writing to the point that it affects the story in a very specific way, usually making it less believable. The thing is, a perfect character in a story doesn't necessarily do that, and an imperfect character that does do that doesn't meet the traditional definition of a Mary Sue. In my opinion, things like the amount of success should not define a Mary Sue. Those are more just symptoms that may or may not arise. What defines a Mary Sue is the plot's willingness to make them look good to the point that it ignores other rules of storytelling. This can be like Rey from Star Wars, whom is just born good at everything. Or it can happen in other ways. If the writing goes out of its way to make a character look like they're in the right, to make them avoid consequences or have the consequences of their failures be meaningless, to retcon continuity just for that character's sake, to have otherwise competent characters look inadequate to the character's presence, and it does this type of favoritism throughout the majority of the character's journey, then even if this character has flaws, within the context of its own story, their flaws are irrelevant. Thus, they are virtually perfect and are indeed a Mary Sue. If a character's flaw is, say, that they're incredibly clumsy, but every clumsy thing they do leads to something good happening, and everyone within the story finds their clumsiness charming, then you no longer have a flawed character because of the context. Being clumsy is no longer a bad thing. 
And this is why I personally think Korra does fit the definition of a Mary Sue. Again, mainly in season one. Yes, Korra does have to train and even gets beaten up a couple of times, but there are little to no moments where the story isn't taking shortcuts to try to make her look good. Season one is littered with examples, but I don't have to go farther than the first episode to prove my point. Korra is told by Tenzin that it's too dangerous for her to go to Republic City. Tenzin is a wise old man with years of experience in politics who also grew up in Republic City. He should, by all rights of his character, know what he's talking about. Korra goes to Republic City anyway to disprove Tenzin's point. Korra is a young, naive woman with zero experience of the outside world and people. Her being this arrogant and trigger happy should be a character flaw. While in the city, Korra gets a glimpse around and because she didn't wait to be escorted, has no idea how to city which causes lots of havoc. This should be a character flaw with lasting consequences. Korra is then captured by the police for causing a ton of destruction and is on the verge of facing prison time. This too should have lasting consequences. So how does this all play out? Well Tenzin comes in bailing Korra out of jail and tells Lin he'll pay for everything, solving the problem Korra created. Her actions did not have lasting consequences and thus she did not need to learn anything. Korra gives a speech about how her inexperienced view of the city proves she needs to be there because it's totally messed up. Her character flaw is turned into a strength, not by her own actions, but by the writing that asks you to believe Korra just cause she said so. Because Korra is quote unquote in the right in this situation, Tenzin is made to look incompetent for his original decision to keep her away from the city. This competent character looks incompetent so that Korra can be right. Within the first episode, the writing of The Legend of Korra demands that we root for Korra, even though using obvious logic would tell us that she is the character we should root against. She is the character that causes the problems, who should be wrong about society, and whom should be humbled at the end. But that's dismissed because that's not what the writing wants us to believe. And we get a full season of this. There's maybe one or two moments where Korra has to face lasting consequences of her actions and realize that she's a flawed person, but all of that goes away by the end of the season. Korra's flaws and failures have little impact on the plot and on her character, which is why she starts out season two just as hot-headed as she did in season one. She didn't have to learn anything. While I could continue to hate on this character, and I could because I really don't like her, Korra herself is not the point of this video. The point is, there are characters who pull the audience out of the experience in the same way flawless characters do without themselves being perfect. This happens despite their flaws due to the writing still telling you that they are perfect because of how it treats their imperfections. The takeaway from this video is to understand why the argument who is a Mary Sue gets so convoluted. If you're going by the traditional definition, then characters like Korra are indeed excluded from it. However, considering characters like that still have an identical impact on the story, I think it's time we move past the original definition and realize that any character whom the plot is willing to play favorites towards throughout the overwhelming majority of the character's stay is indeed perfect within the context of its own story and is thus a Mary Sue. This has been Shady Durags. So long, farewell, Matt Vitason. goodbye.